This episode is not just for the healers and empaths out there in the world, the therapists, helpers, counselors, wellness practitioners, doctors, firefighters, anyone who's in a caretaking role, but it's for everyone. In this episode, we look at empathy and where it goes wrong, from what place do we support other people or offer our help or care? Is it from a wounded place or is it from a place of wholeness and loving that goes both ways? We look at how it is that there are subtle ways that we try to save people, but that may be coming from our own fears and how death, fear of death and fear of pain might be connected or tied up in these interactions. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Embody Podcast, a show about remembering and embodying your true nature, inner wisdom, embodied healing, and self-love. My name is Candace Wu, and I'm a holistic healing facilitator, intuitive coach, and artist sharing my personal journey of vulnerability, offering meditations and guided healing support, and having co-creative conversations with healers and wellness practitioners from all over the world. I want to give a shout out to all of you who support me and the podcast by offering your money and donation to uh, contribute to the behind the scenes production of the podcast. Each episode takes several hours to edit and produce, to format and to publish. And also, not to mention my own creative effort of sitting with what's here with me, receiving your feedback, receiving information from around me to create something that feels alive and vulnerable, real. So all of your contributions and donations are so wonderful. I appreciate it so much. And it really touches me that you're willing to offer that. If the podcast has inspired you in any way or supported you, offered you something and you want to give back, I would so appreciate if you did and checked out all of my offerings that you can receive in return or just to offer donation without anything in return. And I have a new page for all that. It's at candacewu.com slash support. I used to use Patreon and we're in the process now of shifting everything over from Patreon over to my website, just so that all of your, every penny can go towards the production of the podcast and the least amount of processing fees can um, be taken from that. So jump on over to CandiceWu.com slash support if you're interested in checking that out. And you can follow the links to my offerings, all of my offerings, my one-on-one client sessions, the Ally with Death Experience, which will soon be an audio experience as well, the Sound Sleep album, all of my retreats and workshops, as well as the personal meditations that you can order and the embodied group call that happens once a month. All of that is in support of the podcast and the new creations that I'm uh, putting forward and developing. Thank you so much for considering donating. And it's always touching to hear from you, even if it's to share uh, your feedback about what's working for you and what's not on the podcast, in the experientials with guests, or to ask questions and offer topics that you want to hear about. And by just jumping on and listening or sharing it with a friend that you feel might be supported by one of the topics or experientials. Thank you so much. So welcome to the podcast. I've still been in Michigan and enjoying it so much. It's interesting that everything in my body is calling me to stay very, very grounded. I even tried to schedule a flight to see a friend and the internet dropped out several times. Their website wasn't working. The The flight that I wanted to get was through my rewards card in my credit card. And so I kept trying day after day. And finally, I gave up on the credit card rewards and just thought, okay, I'll just pay for this. And I found a flight that I had been looking at previously. And then it turned to like $500 to go from here to Milwaukee. 
And it was like, forget it. I'll just take the train, which is only going to, you know, be another hour of train ride. No big deal. And it maybe cost me like $50 or something like that. It really wasn't about the money. It was just clear to me, though, that I was getting stopped in my efforts here several times. And I listened to those cues, whether that's a message from the universe or um, if you see it, that maybe my spirit guides were sending me a message or just something in me was really not wanting that and it was manifesting or just coincidence. Whatever it is, I like to receive that as a message that I'm meant to stand the ground. So, of course, I booked an Amtrak ticket and that just went through really easily. So I do notice that when things move through easily, it's usually the right thing with when I'm feeling at ease, when I'm feeling at peace and content. Do you notice that in your experiences? Where are you feeling that decisions come with ease and you feel very at peace? Do you feel that way? There's a sense in me that even when I feel a little bit of anxiety about something, I first investigate what that is. Is it a fear or is it something in me that's telling me, no, it's you're not really fully in this. Lately, I've been almost, my body has almost demanded that I be 100% in my decisions, in how I spend my time and in what I'm doing in my life at the bottom line and in that moment. I noticed that I chose to do something recently and it was a, it was somewhat a big commitment and I was only like 95% in it in myself. Something in me was like, well, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do this. And I ended up doing it for other reasons. There were some reasons I did want to do it, of course. But while I was experiencing it, I saw all the reasons emerge to the surface as to why I was hesitant. There was a lot in me about the situation as well as I wanted to spend a lot of alone time and doing certain things for myself that I needed to be doing, even just sitting and being present lately through uh, all that's been happening energetically and astrologically. I've needed a lot of time to just sit and digest all that's happening inside and out. So the information I'm getting right now is for me to be 100% a yes about the things that I choose in my life. And noticing that when it's a maybe or if I'm not 100% that it's a no until I do feel completely all in. I know there are things that I need to do that I don't, on some level, I don't want to do, like certain tasks. I don't love doing administrative tasks. I don't love doing just like the technical things anymore as much as I used to. And yet, underneath it all, I know I want to be doing this because that's for the podcast or that's for this blog post that I'm writing or the newsletter or something that really comes down to, oh, yes, I do want to do that. So if I can't find a reason all the way down to the bottom, then maybe it's good to just let it go. Before we jump into the episode today, I also want to update you about the past life experience that came up that I talked about in the podcast two weeks ago. This podcast is at candicewu.com slash deep mystery. If you want to check it out, I talked about how I went camping, slept with a knife in my hands because I made some bad choices, one could say. Uh, but those choices led me to revealing a past life memory in its fullness, which allowed me to heal on an even deeper level. And where I'm at now is claiming that part of me that is me from this past life that has all sorts of knowing and wisdom. So after that acupuncture appointment that I spoke about where this whole memory revealed to me that I was Native American and had gotten raped, 
by a white man and that my father had to leave me to die, I went into see what was the next step as far as this memory. Like, why did I need to be seeing this now? And what was it that wanted to reveal itself to me from me? And where I was led was to claim this young woman that I was as a Native American. My body gives me confirmation when I sense into and imagine what what that life was like. And then I, I see or think something very quickly. And the confirmation I got was that I was a young, young girl hitting puberty and, and stepping into a rite of passage moment of being a woman. And I wanted to do a ceremony that really fit who I was. And I was very fierce. I was like a warrior. I, very stubborn, wanted to do things my own way, very strong, and a leader, wanting to be a leader. And in that time, I'm not sure um, how supported I was. In some ways, I felt too big to fit into the containers of the tribe. And it seemed like the women of the tribe wanted to do the ceremony the way that we do the ceremony. And I got really upset and Uh, wanted to do it my way, and that's where I got into trouble. So as I looked into the eyes of my past self, I could see the ferocity in her, the fire, and fierceness. I could see that she knew how to live in the wild. She knew the plants. She knew the horses. She knew the animals. She knew earth and the medicine that each of those bring as well as song and ceremony, and how to fight. She knew how to use bow and arrow, a knife, and to maneuver and to use fight energy if she needed to protect herself or to hunt. She was a hunter. So that just catalyzed in me the desire to take my ability to protect myself and be strong in myself to another level. A lot of people take martial arts or do some self-defense classes. I've done both of those at some point. And now at this time in my life, I want to experience some different things and sharpen those skills that I do have. So I signed up for a, a lesson in sharp weapons. While I was camping, I was you know, the thought, the only thing I had was the knife in my hands. And I thought, okay, I'll just sleep with this. If you had listened to that episode, you'll get the full picture. And so now I'm just thinking, well, if I'm going to have a knife in my hand, I better know how to use it. And hopefully I never need to use it. When you learn martial arts, it's not to learn to literally just fight people anywhere you go and and to be violent or aggressive in your life. It's just that you develop the confidence that you're able to use certain parts of your body and energy to protect yourself or to uh, to do something that's necessary if you're ever in that situation. And whether you're n- you are or not in that situation, that confidence that you can develop is really strengthening for the whole nervous system, for who we are in the world. If we all feel more confident, more in our bodies, more able to protect ourselves, we can feel safer. And that's the idea now. So I'm taking the sharp weapons class and combat weapons. I think that's like a baseball bat and how to use things to to hit in the proper way, as well as archery and bow and arrow. And uh, it's really fun. It's so fun. And um, I'm also able to use my eyes in a different way to direct my energy and be a little more precise at a distance, especially with archery. I find that my aim is horrible. (laughs) And It has a lot to do with my focus and ability to sustain that focus at a distance. And I don't think it's coincidence that I am nearsighted and need glasses or contacts. 
And also this past life part of me now is being more integrated into me. I pictured her integrating into my body and being me, which is the truth. I be- Well, that's the truth I believe, is that through the many lives that we have, we cultivate different knowings and sets of wisdom that are in our bodies, a moving wisdom. And when we birth into the next life, sometimes we want to develop different parts of ourselves and we might forget the previous parts or we might remember them and be be a genius in that. But there's something here in this life for us to learn and there's a way in which we can claim, remember, and use all of the wisdom that came from different lives that we developed in different lives. And recently I've been more attuned to the interstellar world, the world outside of Earth, and that there are other dimensions within Earth and outside of Earth that we might be learning in as well and bringing those tools into our lives here, or maybe that's where we're moving on to next. I never thought I would believe in that exactly, or I I guess I just couldn't find a way for it to click with me that that existed. You know, and some people talk about aliens uh, or other other life, and it's starting to make a little more sense to me that we as energies, as part of the universal consciousness, we we find ourselves in different dimensions or we go to different places and times and lifetimes to to know the wholeness of the universe all the possibilities all the energies that we can be that we are and and we get to experience human life to to heal and to learn and to grow and to be and to honor who we are So as I look into myself as this past life, I just feel a connection with earth and animals in a new way. And I had an Akashic reading with Vanessa Rodriguez, who was on the podcast very early on. In that reading, my guides were telling me to stay on the land and to look into plant medicine and connect with the plants that that would be revealed to me. And all this feels very exciting. It feels very enlivening and resourcing. So enough about that for now. Feel free to jump onto that episode two weeks ago if you didn't get a chance to experience that. It also comes with an experiential called You Are the Way, that you are the way to the mystery of your life and uh, you are the way to everything. So now let's jump into the episode for today. This topic has been on my mind for I don't know at least a year but somehow I've I've just resisted talking about it and what made me come to it now was that many people around me are talking about it and asking me questions about what I think about it and it seems like a lot of people are sorting out who they are and what's happening in their dynamics with people, in their intimate relationships, with their clients or with friends, with colleagues. And really that is the topic for today. It's who are you in relation to others? And is part of your role in your relationships to quote unquote help people or to care for them or to heal them? save them, feel responsible for them. In this episode, everything I'm saying, there's nothing wrong with any way of being and there's nothing wrong with wherever you're at. It's really looking at, oh, that's where I'm at. Like, Wouldn't you rather know who you are being and who you are right now than not know? And that knowing gives you the chance to to make a clear, continue to make a clear choice in your sovereignty of who you are, or to make a new choice. 
So the knowing and awareness gives freedom. The knowing and awareness is not meant for criticism, to shame yourself or to pressure yourself to be someone else or something else. Because the bottom, 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 bottom line is that you are the energy of all consciousness. You are pure love through a body. And in this body, we've chosen different ways to express pure consciousness. And sometimes we think that those ways are who we are. We identify or we feel we're just one way and that's who we are. There are very specific ways of being that's in our DNA. So that's a biological coding, but then there's an energetic coding underneath that, an energetic signature of who you've chosen to be in this life or who you are in this life, whatever you believe in. And if you're in line with that, you might feel very much true to yourself. And that is true to your sovereignty, true to your choice. And underneath that is the love that we all are, the all possibility that we all are. Then there's the layer like removed from your choice of who you are specifically in this life that's unique to you and what you might express in your life. So I want to tell you a bit about me and my development and evolution of um, this feeling that I was responsible for people and wanting to really heal others to where I am today in a much freer place for myself and others, in a place that really honors myself more and honors other people in the fullness that they are. When I first came to being a therapist and healer, I had come from being a teacher, working with kids, and I saw very early in my career how much wisdom children had and how alive that wisdom was, how fresh and real it was. It wasn't some lines that someone had fed to them. Sometimes it was, but (laughs) other times when they were really present and I was really present with them, there were these gems of what they were feeling and thinking that would come alive. And so after I was a teacher, I taught art for um, kindergarten through second grade as well as sixth through eighth grade. And I loved the middle school age. After that, I transitioned into going to grad school for clinical psychology, studying Ayurveda, studying yoga as well, and all these other indigenous healing practices at the same time, along with family constellations. And emerging from all of those learnings, there was a way in which I, I still felt so responsible for people's emotions and their well-being. After working with clients, sometimes I would feel a weight in me. And then son- somehow I was the one digesting the emotions that seemed to be part of what the person was telling me they were experiencing or the storyline in which these emotions would emerge from. So it seemed like people were not quite digesting their own energy and I was taking it on and doing it for them. That was so much work. And I was also doing that in my personal relationships. I had this way of having friendships where we were there for each other through all of what we were experiencing and while that can be beautiful and and I still have that in some ways it was the primary way of connecting with people is to you know share each of our problems back and forth and in a sense be that co-regulating parental loving force that I needed to help me develop that in myself but I wasn't seeing it that way at the time I was just continuing to rely on 
people in my life to give that to me and I would give it back. And I found that that also in itself had an exhaustion level because I was seeing the power outside of me to some degree, but not consciously. So as I looked at this deeper, it revealed to me that I was a shaman in a past life and a witch. And specifically in my shaman time, it was essential for me to be responsible for my village, for my people and tribe. And they came to me to receive healing and to receive guidance. And I would stay in my cave to restore. And that kind of worked because I was living in nature and was able to feel the earth resource and to use use my shamanistic skills very well in moving energy and um, connecting with many dimensions to support me. I don't really know the details of that, and it, it doesn't seem that important right now, but what is really important is that in a, on a cellular level, I was skilled at taking in other people's energy, like literally sucking it out of them and then spitting it out, coughing it up. And I was the function of the healing. I realized that that was a very old way of healing for me then. It was from lifetimes ago. And that in this lifetime, it wasn't for me anymore. I wanted to find what was me in a fresh way, an expanded way for me in this life to, to grow into being of support to others walking alongside people instead of being bigger than them in a way. As a shaman, that was expansive at that time. It was needed and it was purposeful and I wanted to do that. If you are doing that right now or you find yourself having a similar way of being with these patterns, that's okay. There's no judgment from me and and there really isn't judgment necessary about that. The real question is, is that how you want to be? And is that the best for your expansion and your well-being in this life right now? And maybe it was before, like a year ago or yesterday. (laughs) And maybe it's not now. Or maybe you were in a different way of being and now that is very interesting, enlivening, and expansive. So there's no right way. There's no best way that applies to all. There's only what's best for you. Another piece of this all is that because I came into this life with this way of being able to take other people's energy and release it, digest it and release it, or just get rid of it, For whatever other reasons, I came into a specific family that needed that, or that uh, seemed to not have the functions of digesting their emotions and supporting and loving their well-being. So early on in my childhood, even as an infant, I had this impression and feeling sense that I was here to be responsible for other people. And we can look at this in all sorts of psychological or soul, soulful ways. We can see this from conditions of worth through Carl Rogers' work in psychology, where uh, what are the ways in which I have to act to be worthy and to be loved? And from a family constellation's perspective, that's very similar. Where do I need to stand and who do I need to be? Who is in not myself, but who else do I need to be? What energy do I need to hold, or what do I need to do to belong in this family, to be seen? Where's the energy, the direction of energy going from family members where I need to be right there so they can see me? And is that in the middle of chaos? Is that in the middle of devastation? And for me, I felt so. Uh, needing to be a parent to my parents 
so that I could be seen. There were things and patterns that had happened back in my ancestry that created that or were a part of that dynamic. So it's not to blame my parents. It started long before them. But it's to say that I stood in the role of my parents, responsible to my parents as a young child, and yet I could never fill that role. So along with that came not being enough and wanting to help my parents so that I could ultimately be enough and be seen as enough. Taking care of their emotions, taking care of their well-being, taking care of my siblings from the place of needing to feel worthy and enough. And that lived on for, for many, 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 many years after that. And it's not just a mental process to say, oh, I'm doing that, so let me stop. It's in my body. It's in the responses of my nervous system to what wasn't safe and what felt like was the safest I could get to. And where could I even find some something for me? And there's a deeper love there too, loving other people, loving my family members, wanting everyone to belong and making sure that they do by helping, by supporting. So through all this and working with all these pieces, past life, lineage, belief sets that come through from all this, I felt into a new way for me that was to be in myself, to be fully who I am, doing what I want to do, loving myself, and therefore having a two-way kind of love that reaches out to others as well. That's not from a place of, I'm not enough, and if I care for you, I'll be enough. Or I'll be needed. Or I'll be validated. It's, I validate myself, and I can use tools and support and resource from around me to enhance my ability and capacity to love myself and to continue to develop it. It doesn't just happen suddenly and and ending there, but a continual process of that and being in the place of my adult present self that has capacity to continue to love myself and what comes up or to notice when it's not happening, and can see others with that same capacity, or a deeper capacity, the greatest capacity of all possibility, living in each person around me, no matter how they express in a human form. For me, it's to be a compassionate witness to what they're experiencing, to be present with them, to honor it, and not try to change it or assume that it wants to be changed or that they want to change, to respect someone else's desire and move with them from there, checking in with what they desire and what their choices are. And ultimately, it's seeing that they're in the hands of the universe, which is them, which is themselves and everything around them. In a family constellations perspective, it's seeing that they have an entire lineage of wise and strong people where something had to go right for them to exist in this life and to exist right now. And perhaps a whole soul belonging that they have or entourage of guides, resource, earth, animals that may be supporting them in some way, whether they know it or not, that I can see exists for them as well. And if I'm able to hold that, I can see this person much more clearly. And if I'm also able to accept that death has its place, that pain has its place, that sadness has its place, Anger has its place, and all of that is is part of the beauty of what we get to experience. Not just tolerable, but part of the beauty. 
then when I see someone in pain, I don't need to just immediately rescue them. Rescuing them is also something that can be done, and it's not a bad thing. Sometimes we need to be rescued. Sometimes other people need to be rescued. But it also depends on what the deeper want, need, and capacity is, and what one can do for themselves, which is much more powerful at the core than what another can do for someone else. Now, there's that's also to be argued. Like, there are definitely super impactful moments where somebody else has said something to me or done something for me that made a huge difference. So I'm not saying to not do any of that, but I am saying that I'm interested in guiding myself from my heart and also my deeper knowing. And at any time, my deeper knowing and my capacity to feel into my heart might not be the fullest it could possibly be which is probably true, you know, this is why I'm here to expand and to continue to deepen in that. But even to the max of what I do have at any moment, I might not be there. How much of me is here? How much of me is available? And from that place, what do I desire to do? And from the place that also holds another in their wholeness. How do I want to be and interact? If it's a crisis situation, like something very immediate, that might be a totally different process. I'm not going to sit there and meditate on it or (laughs) think about it like that. I might just act. And in the aftermath, I might see who I was being in that moment. And if I stand behind myself, or not. And that can go for really any situation, crisis or not. Do I stand behind the choice I made? And one of my teachers, Susie Tucker, says that she likes to make choices that allow her to continue to make more choices that she can stand behind. That's my interpretation of what she has shared with with me, to be exact. So it's really Also a question of how are we using our gifts? I do have a gift of being able to work with energy and do something with energy that people may or may not want to do something with. And as a young child that was overused, are you overusing your gifts or overworking? When you're in interaction with someone else, are you constantly using one way of being or one tool in yourself, one gift in yourself. I also want to talk about empathy in this episode. I love talking about empathy. I've had a really different relationship with empathy, and that definitely relates to the process in which I see myself and my role. Empathy in the past for me has meant Not just being in another's shoes and seeing that perspective, but feeling it on a whole body and energetic level. And before, I just wasn't able to give it back. Like I could feel into someone's experience, and then somehow I'd be left with it. And it was my deeper pattern of taking that on, taking responsibility. But also, sometimes it was my own experience being triggered. And me relating to someone and having identified with them energetically because I had that experience in some way and those feelings. So for me, sometimes it was a double whammy, like having to be triggered, my experiences being triggered and looking at that and also seeing the the umbrella or the holding pattern to that, which was to take on other people's feelings and feel responsible for them, feel feel like I have to be bigger than them and hold that space for someone. When sometimes who I'm talking to is older than me or more developed than me, whatever. It, it really doesn't matter if they're older or younger. But in the case of my parents, it did. 
So I want to talk about when empathy goes wrong. And I kind of hesitate to use those words, but maybe it's better to say when empathy goes too far. If we see empathy on a spectrum where maybe one point of empathy is to be able to witness someone with some warmth, with, with our capacity of presence and awareness there, and to see them in their experience and honor that they're experiencing it and that they're whole enough to handle it. If we see them in that light versus if we see them with pity or um, assume that we feel something, that they feel something about it, then we can project our own feelings on them. And in return, they feel differently in relation to us. Have you noticed that where someone believes in you versus where someone also feels a similar doubt as you towards you? Like, oh yeah, you know, I'm not sure. You might feel differently in your body and in your heart. So that's where I like to be in seeing myself as full and seeing another as full. And witnessing what's happening and just being present, being being there. It doesn't mean I have to give advice or support or say loving words. It might just be as much as seeing what they're experiencing. I see I see your pain. I see that you're in this experience. From that place to maybe taking on some of their emotions or uh, when we assume, as I said, that someone feels a certain way, we're projecting our feelings. But those are our feelings about that kind of experience. Have you ever had an experience where someone told you that they're in a certain situation or something happened to them and you say, oh no, or you say, oh, I'm so sorry. And they say, oh, I'm fine about it. And sometimes that's denial, but sometimes that's actually true, right? And so where where there's a mismatch to how you assumed they would feel and they actually feel. And maybe they feel upset later but right now in the moment they're saying they feel fine it's a different topic to challenge them or say oh to have empathy and say oh wait you know it seems like there's something else here that's something else but when we just outright assume something and that's not where they're at we get this chance to see that that was our own projection and where we think or we can call it empathy to have to have offered that feeling from us it's not actually empathy it's actually being in our own experience seeing it from our way also when we feel for someone we feel for them instead of them feeling for themselves in a way instead of seeing them and trusting their own ability to feel an experience, we might take on that whole energy of the feeling and they may be discarding it or leaving it with you. Maybe not, but that's possible. That whole dynamic is a very developmentally young experience for the person that might be discarding it and, and that you may be the parental figure holding and being that digestive space. And this is an interesting dynamic because then we also need to look at if you're the one being that parental figure or holding space, why are you doing it? It can be easy to say that it's empathy and I'm being caring and um, supporting someone, but is that serving a purpose for you that also is? A pattern of yours or is something that keeps you in a cycle or a smaller space for yourself a dependency for yourself do you depend on other people to need you 
or do you pride yourself on the ability to use this tool and keep others dependent on you? Does this give you your validation or enoughness like it has for me in the past of varying degrees? You know, there's a whole dynamic of empath narcissist that people label as this empath narcissist dynamic where someone who's really empathic and intuitive and sensitive attracts, they mutually attract each other. Um, someone who has traits of narcissism that uh, may draw the attention towards them and need that kind of support and dependency and can hook someone in to be that for them in in almost every capacity or to varying degrees of their lives. There's a whole, that's a whole different topic and there's so much more to that story. But we often see the empath with more um, empathy, I guess. We look upon that more favorably to be the empath in that situation, to be the helper in that situation rather than the helped. We see that perhaps the empath is doing something better than the narcissist is doing because sometimes the narcissist, the person we call the narcissist, I really don't like to use that label. We often see them as like lashing out if the other person isn't doing what they want or using manipulation to keep the person who is very sensitive and caring in that space for them. And yet, doesn't the person who is empathic and sensitive do the same thing? There's a manipulation happening on both levels. When this dynamic is happening of perpetrator-victim as well, when it goes to that level that one is a victim of the other, both people are tied up with some energy coming from the same energy. Both people are tied up with belief sets that come from the same similar place of worthiness, need, or validation, or dependency. Somewhere we can find that there's a place in which both are codependent. And in other cases of empathy, where empathy can go too far, is where we put ourselves aside. We put others before us and prioritize their feelings and needs and maybe sometimes even feel an urgency about that. And we put our own basic needs sometimes or lives aside. This can happen where uh, a mother looks towards their child and says, I need to um, give everything to this child. I need to be there for them. They're not feeling well in X, Y, and Z places, and I need to be there, and I need to help them. And we look at that person's life as a whole, and I'm not bashing mothers at all. I, I think being a mother is uh, one of the most honorable and beautiful things one can do. But when a mother puts themselves aside and focuses all their energy on their child, we do need to wonder what about their own life and what does that say to the child? You're worthy, but I'm not. And essentially at the bottom, that says, that's a mother saying, I'm not worthy of taking care of myself. And that message gets transmitted to the child inherently, implicitly, in the body, in the actions. And those actions speak louder sometimes than what's covering it up, the helping that's coming their way, all the energy coming their way. And it puts that child in a position of a lot of weight. Like, I have to be so much better, or I have to have so much help, and I have to do this for my mother too. Because if I don't, then she's not going to be okay. And how different for a child. To see their mother taking care of themselves, to see their mother in their fullness, 
giving them the space to be in their fullness or be in their struggle, whatever it is, but their mother reaching out from there helps them to see the way because their mother is part of showing them the way that she's having opens up a pathway that a child can see, oh, I have a way too. And I am worthy of taking care of myself and I can learn how to do that. I don't always have to just give to others like my mom's doing. There's a way that we implicitly and in our, in some way comes out sideways that we can be just like our parents, especially with the parts of our parents we resist or don't want to be like. And this is where it can come out. You know, we can be just like our mom that gave us all the focus and energy and gave herself none by doing that somewhere in our lives. And then we don't know how to take care of ourselves. So I've used this mother and child example, but this really can apply to any relationship. If you are giving all of yourself to your friend and nothing to yourself or very little and not enough, not taking care of what you really need to feel full, healthy, and whole, then you're not really able to fully be present for your friend or whoever else it is anyway. But also on the receiving end, that support is coming from a very um, small capacity, small energy, and not to belittle it, but to say that there isn't much there if we're giving away everything and none to ourselves. So that's where empathy can go too far as well. It can really take a toll on someone. And on the surface, it can be seen as a selfless act. We we often overstate, I think, selflessness. We see people giving so much to others and we praise that and we praise that. And how much do we praise people taking care of themselves? That's very much shifting. We're doing that so much more, at least in the fields that I'm running around, like in the mental health field, in wellness, there's, that's shifting where we're saying, yes, good, you took care of yourself. And there's just through threads of time where we valued being selfless. Meaning doing for others and not yourself. Meaning doing and being kind to the world around you at its fullest and not needing to put yourself in that mix it as well. There's a time and place for selflessness. If, and I know that it's also in many spiritual practices, it's really a discussion of where someone is at the level of having transcended the ego dance, the dance of pain and um, being triggered, like those triggers, those wounds are more healed or at a level where they're not in control of someone's life and where they're maybe not even a thing, where unconditional love is very present. That's where some people might call these people or beings ascendant masters there's a selflessness to that and also it might be necessary in times where someone is truly selfish and just uh, very self-centered to the point that it's hurting them it's not their growth edge anymore that um, it hurts them and others or that the new growth would be to Learn to let that love reach out to other people, not just themselves. And there's a whole host of developmental, like young child parts to that that are probably connected. But when we force selflessness, even in that situation that I'm talking about where it might be helpful to be a little more selfless, when we force it and not heal it and develop it organically, When we force it, there's always some tension or resistance living in our bodies and in the system that we live in, in the community. Our body will show it. 
We can't skip being selfish and developing our sense of self and caretaking for ourselves and being there for ourselves, loving ourselves, developing an identity so that we can eventually release that identity and be fuller. That's part of our developmental process as a human, as a child, and in our soul, that we need to know who we are and fill up on who we are, be seen and mirrored and and take in all that love so we can know who we are and be egocentric like five-year-olds are, right? If they get to be. And if we didn't get to be, we didn't get that loving attunement, we might still be asking for that now in our lives. And that's where we can give that to ourselves and organically heal that so we can become more naturally in the place of love from within, loving towards ourselves, and loving outwards. I really don't love to call it selflessness, but I did want to address that topic of selflessness. In order to ascend, when people talk about ascension, it's about um, being one with the universe, the light that we are, the unconditional love that is who we are. When we ascend in human form, we must descend into the body and become embodied, live in the human form, master all the ways of being human not just the functional things that we need to do and learn how to do in this consciousness of earth and how earth functions right now and how people function on earth, but to come with our own creativity and also to master navigating all the emotions and ways of being that one can be, to have the capacity to embrace all of it and know how to work with it and use it and feel your inner knowing. So back to selflessness just for another moment here. When we do do for others and we take empathy to that degree and supporting others or caretaking for others to the degree we're not taking care of ourselves, Often that also serves to distract from what you need to do for yourself, whether that's looking at a wound that's really hard to look at or something that is going on for you. It serves to help you feel powerful or in control or okay when you can help other people when they're not okay or see people as not okay and continue to like, create that or find like find those parts in others and that's how you're relating to people but where also you might be distracting from your life path like what you want to be spending your time with where you're most empowered what you're desiring for you and your worthiness do you feel like you are are worthy of pleasure enjoyment, peace. And those endeavors, looking at those parts of us, if we continue to avoid those parts, we really don't do a service to anyone. That is the deepest service to all. It's the deepest loving to know who you are and to move towards what you desire to be in your pleasure, to be in your worthiness. There's one last piece I want to mention with with all this, is that there's a difference between being caring and being a caretaker as your one role or as your main role. And there's nothing wrong with being a caretaker as your main role. Like That might be your job title. That might be what you're choosing to do. It's really how you do it. And why you're doing it. If you're doing it on some unconscious level to distract from your own life, how how much do you want to do that? It's okay to do that. Sometimes we need to distract from our lives. Sometimes we need to feel that empowerment that we get when we can help someone else with their life and 
also recognize and have perspective that maybe our issue is not so bad or we're in this together. So there's nothing wrong with any of it. It's the question for you if you want to explore it, only if you want to explore it, is that there's multiple parts of who you are and are they all being looked at? Are they being offered in this life and expressed in who you are, honored in yourself? Are we living our lives? Are we in our roles in our lives coming from a place of woundedness driving underneath, whether that's conscious or unconscious? You may have heard of the archetype Wounded Healer and uh, Sarah Buino has a whole podcast of conversations with a wounded healer and talking about these very things like where are we coming from and who are we what is a wounded healer and identifying that so we can see that happening in us if we want to see it and make sure that that's the choice we want to have or choosing what we want to have and before we go and end this episode, I want to talk about endings and death. I touched into death just once in this conversation, but for me, all this conversation also amounts to embracing death and all sorts of emotions as part of the, the beauty of experience, as I mentioned. But death, we're often afraid of death or we have all these emotions that pour out from it or nothing at all. Everyone experiences death differently and sees it differently, but are you at peace with death? And if you're not, what is your relationship with death? And how does that show up in ways in which you help others or are in relation to others? If I resist death or resist certain emotions, when I interact with others, then I resist to some degree, whether that's subtle or not, or overt, covert or overt, I might resist what they're experiencing. And ultimately that dishonors them, that might even dismiss what they're experiencing or disrespect them. But when I have the capacity to honor anger, pain, death, sadness, annoyance, any emotion that is challenging, even joy. When I have the capacity to hold that in myself and see it, be with it, respect it, then I can do that for others too, or I can begin to. Sometimes we think that Others need our help. We have a suggestion for them and we want to give it to them or give them our advice or do something for them. And we do need to keep ourselves in check because what does that say to someone else? That their situation is not okay? That their choice isn't okay? Or we could do it better? My friend Nick Werber talks a lot about this. Uh, embracing one's fate. And in the family constellations world, we discuss that that thought. Like, accepting one's fate means accepting their choices. It means accepting, not just accepting, but respecting and agreeing with them of their own choice. It's really not for us to agree to, but respecting it. So I leave you today with these questions. How are you relating to yourself? What parts of yourself are you able to be with? Who are you? Where are you coming from when you're in a role of helping others or caretaking or coaching or being a therapist or being a friend, a daughter, a son? mother or father? How is it that you see people be honest? And in different situations, it might be different. And how is it that you want to see people? How is it that is a deeper 
seeing. Where do you believe you know more than someone else, whether you assert it or not? Or where you believe those thoughts that you feel you know more than them or why they're where they're at and that you can see something they can't? There's a fine line of intuition and asserting yourself energetically, inserting yourself and violating energetically because you feel you know more. Where are you working harder than someone else for their lives? And what parts of yourself need caretaking, saving, or tending to? What parts of yourself are asking for empathy? What parts of yourself want to feel worthy and in your pleasure, desire, and in the life that is 100% you? And do you push that aside for others? Or do you push that aside, period? So I think that's enough for today. I loved this conversation and had a lot of fun. I'd love to hear your feedback, your discussions around this, or what comes up in you around this. And uh, if you disagreed with me or um, found something I said offensive, uh, feel free to share that. If you found something that helped you explore, I'd love to hear about that as well. To close today, I'll just offer all the different podcasts that I referred to and the people that I referred to as well as other episodes that can relate to this topic. So I gave a shout out to Vanessa Rodriguez, who did the Akashic reading for me recently. She is excellent, and she also works with Feeding Your Wild. Her episode on the Embody podcast is at CandiceWu.com slash Vanessa, V-E-N-E-S-S-A. And there you can also connect up with her website, feedyourwell.com, I believe, and all of the different links that she offers. I shared about Susie Tucker, my family constellations teacher, and you can find her at susietucker.com or at candicewoo.com slash Susie, her episode with me on the podcast. And her name is spelled S-U-Z-I. I also mentioned my friend Nick Werber, who is a constellations facilitator he and I love talking about death, and we did in this episode at CandiceWood.com slash Nick. I mentioned Sarah Buino in her podcast, Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I actually appeared on that podcast, and that was so much fun. You can find that episode at CandiceWood.com slash Conversations with a Wounded Healer. And there you'll be able to link to her whole podcast. Also, I mentioned the Deep Mystery of Life episode that was two weeks ago at CandiceWu.com slash Deep Mystery. And we spoke a lot about self-worth, worthiness. And there's an episode that isn't a discussion, but it's more like a download around worthiness where it's set to music and I just say affirmations and support the body in in taking that in and that's at my website slash worthiness also if you want to stay up to date on my travels on the podcast guests experientials and topics retreats workshops things that i'm offering you can tune into my newsletter that comes out every two or three weeks you can sign up at CandiceWu.com slash embody. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's really great to have you and looking forward to connecting with you next time on the Embody Podcast. <laughs>